Hey, if you got your Bibles, and you want to go ahead and turn to 1 Kings, we're going to get there. When you came in today, I had a special gift for everybody in the service. Did you get your gift that was on your seat? Okay, hang on to that. Put that in 1 Kings, and we're going to come back to that at the end of the service. But that is my special gift to you as a reminder of something, and we're going to get to that here in just a little bit. But as we get into this, we're going to start a new series here uh, in November, and it is called Greater. Now, it is off of the book that Stephen Furtick wrote. Has anybody read the book Greater by Stephen Furtick? It is an incredible book. It tells the story of an incredible move of God upon an incredible man, and it is really uh, just a kind of a foreshadowing of what I believe God wants to do in each and every one of our lives in this place. But before I even get started today, I wanted to come down here and just get real with you for just a moment, and I wanted to ask you a couple of questions, and I'm going to ask our congregation to be very, very, very transparent and honest with me. Can you do that? Have you ever gone through a time in your life that you had a struggle? <laughs> Let me. Can I just stop there and just see uh, how many has ever struggled with anything? But let's go just a little further than that. Has anybody come into this place today and you've walked in here and you're going, I'm not just in a struggle and I'm not just in a situation. I am in a funk. I'm, there is a cloud that is over me. Can I talk to you for just a moment? Can you come right here for just a moment? This is what I believe. I believe more than anything God's got a plan and a destiny for your life, for greater things. Sometimes we don't understand what the greater things of God are, but for greater things. I want you to take this. This is your gift. This is going to help you through this entire series prepare your heart, your mind, your soul for everything that God wants to do because God wants to do something greater in you. Now, we're going to talk about what that greater is here in a moment, but God's got a plan for your life, and He wants to do something incredible, okay? Okay. But sometimes we come into places like this and we struggle, don't we? We struggle. Has anybody ever struggled with maybe a mental pressure that you've got that you think, mentally, I don't think I can get beyond this. Is there anybody that's had that struggle? Lisa, God wants to do something incredible in your life. Come on down here. God wants to do something absolutely incredible in your life. God wants to move in your life in the most incredible way. Because what I believe God has for you is He's got something greater that goes so far beyond what becomes stagnated in our minds. It goes so far beyond just the mundane of everyday life, but he's got something greater. I want you to take this gift from the church for, to prepare you for what God's going to do, because this is what I believe about November. As everybody else is being thankful about what God is doing in their life, we're going to step out for the miracle that God's got for our life. Has anybody in this place, you, should, you might just say, I'm just stuck in a relationship, you got to be careful if you're going to be the one to stand up on this one, okay? you got to be very careful. But in a relationship problem that I just need God's guidance on. And now, this one's touchy because you may be sitting next to your problem. But then you may be saying, I'm not sitting next to my problem because my relationship problem is because I need to get closer in a relationship with my God. See, it is a relationship problem because maybe you've gotten a little cold. Maybe you've gotten a little distracted. Maybe you've gotten a little messed up in worry and confusion, but you're saying just by a raised hand in honesty, I've got a relationship problem that I truly need God to do something in. Let's see how many honest people we've got with relationship problem. We got a relationship problem. So this is what I know. God is going to do something absolutely incredible in your life. He's going to break something loose in you and there's a miracle that's coming because God doesn't want us to be stagnated. Who's got a relationship? You've got a relationship problem that you're going, God, I just need you to do something absolutely. Can you pass this all the way down to the end of the aisle, Jimmy? All the way down to the end of the aisle. God's got something absolutely incredible that he wants to do in somebody's life. I've got a relationship. You raised your hand. <laughs> I see all things. God wants to do something absolutely incredible in your life. But sometimes situations 
bombard us. And in the middle of a bombarding of a situation, our faith has a tendency sometimes to go, wah, 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 wah. Is anybody in a wah with your faith? You need a touch of God in your life. Greater things are on the horizon. Greater things are coming if we open ourselves up. Is anybody in a little bit of a, of a weird place in your... <laughs> I, every, can you pass that on down to Danica? Uh, I just know that sometimes we get in a funky place. But is there anybody else that you just say, I'm in a weird place right now in my faith. Can you, pa hey, can you pass this all the way down and back one? If, if they try to steal it from you, just tackle them, okay? But this is what I know about God. God wants more than anything to do something greater in your life. Something greater. Mom, God wants to do something greater. He wants to move in our lives in the most incredible way. But this is what I know about seeking God for greater. Sometimes in the pursuit of what God wants to do in our life, sometime in the pursuit of the greater things, what God, I think, wants us to do, what Stephen Furtick writes about in his book, is how to dream bigger. How to dream bigger. But how to start smaller. I tell everybody all the time, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. How to dream bigger, how to start smaller. But in this series, we're going to truly look at how to ignite God's vision for your life. God's vision for your life. So I'm going to take you to 1 Kings chapter 19. Got your Bibles going and turn there. We are going to look at three simple verses. And in these three simple verses that we're looking at, I believe the Word of God is going to paint a very powerful picture of what I believe God wants to do and unleash in every one of our lives. So in 1 Kings 19, we're going to start in verse 19. If you do not have a Bible, we're going to have it on the screen for you. And in 1 Kings 19, 19, it says this. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Saphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him, threw his cloak around him. Elijah Elisha left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and he slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat, and he gave it to every uh, everyone to, to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and become his servant. Now, if you are going to preach a series on greater, on experiencing greater, and wanting greater, and needing greater, and understanding greater, you cannot just stop with this Old Testament story or this Old Testament prophet. We have to go to the New, New Testament and really connect an old thing with a new thing and get a total picture from the Word of God of what God wants to do. So I'm going to take you to John 14, 12. And in John 14, 12, this is Jesus talking to His disciples. He's trying to explain some stuff to them. And this is what He says in the 12th verse. Very truly I tell you, Whosoever believes in me will do what? The works I have been doing. Whosoever believes. Who's a whosoever? You. Each and every person in this place is a whosoever. Whosoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. What are the works that Jesus has been doing when he's talking to his disciples at this point? What are the works? He has been doing miracles. He's been casting out demons. He has been healing people. He's touching lame legs and they're walking. 
He's touching eyes and sight is coming back to them. He's touching people's tongues and they're beginning to speak again. He is doing all kinds of things. But as I looked at all of the miracles of what, what Jesus was doing, I believe the greatest miracle that He ever did, and He says we can do greater things than Him, I believe His greatest miracle was His ability to have an unconditional love on people. <laughs> Don't get too excited, okay? An unconditional love. A love like nobody else could ever have. A love that just goes so much further than anything. And then He goes on to say this, Whoever believes in me and the work uh, believes in me will do the works that I've been doing, and they will do even greater things. What is this greater that Jesus is talking about? What is this greater that he wants us to not just do, he wants us to follow in his example, but almost Jesus is saying, I want you to basically blow me out of the water. All the things that I've been doing, that the Father has empowered me to do, that the Holy Spirit is working in me doing, this is what I want you to do. I want you to not only look at the works, acknowledge the works, see the works, you're going to do greater things than what I've ever done. Greater things in your life. Because I'm going to the Father. Now I want you to grasp a hold of this thought for just a moment. Greater things... What greater things does God have for me in my life? What greater things does God have for me in my workplace, in my marriage, in my family? What greater things is it that God wants me to do, that God wants me to experience? But what is the greater things that He wants me to pour out upon people? If He wanted me to watch His miracles and see what He did and be an example, and He says, you will do greater things than me, can we imagine the thought that I can do greater things than Jesus? Now most of us sit here and we're going to disqualify ourselves right off the bat with that statement. Well, I can't do greater things than Jesus because Jesus was Jesus. But that's not what the Word of God says. He says, I'm going to the Father. I'm sending my Holy Spirit to you. And now through the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, you have the ability to do greater things than what I've been doing. And we look and we go, greater things than Jesus? Greater things than, than this God in flesh who walked on the earth? You mean I can do greater things? Well, as we start this series today called Greater, I'm going to call this message today, if you're taking notes, write this down. It's called Burn the Plows. I handed out books to some of you today because I want you to prepare your mind and I want you to prepare, prepare your heart what I believe God wants to do in your life. I thank God if He could speak to us today. And I think I could actually back this up with Scripture if I had time today to go back and do it all, so you're just going to have to take my word for it. But I believe what God wants more than anything is God wants us to get out of the mundane. God wants to step out of the stagnation of our life. God wants to step out of the routine and, and move into a greater expectation, a greater knowledge, a greater service, and a, and a greater attitude of what He wants to do in our life. And so what we're going to do is today, I'm going to, I'm going to base this message around three basic invitations that we're going to read about. Three basic invitations. And as Elijah gives these three invitations to Elisha, I believe today what the Holy Spirit is speaking to each and every one of our lives these are the th same three invitations that I want to speak into your life today. Three elements that I believe that will elevate us and move us on. And the first one is this, so write this down. It is the invitation to a higher calling. An invitation to a higher calling. Now I think it's important for us to point out what Elisha is doing when the prophet Elijah, who was the spokesperson for God, who spoke for the entire nation of Israel, when Elijah walks by and without a word, it says that he threw a mantle over Elisha's shoulders while he is in the middle of doing a mundane job. That mantle that was thrown over his shoulders signifies the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the call of God. 
And without a single word spoken, the mantle hit Elisha's shoulders. And Elisha knows God is calling him to something greater. You see, what we've got to understand and what we've got to remember in this place today, and I think so many of us, this is where we get lost in our work, walk with God. This is where we get lost in the process of believing that God's got something greater for us. We lose focus of God because the situation gets bigger than our God. And when the situation gets bigger than our God, we minimize the size of our God in our mind, we minimize the size of God in our heart, and we minimize the size of God in our faith. And then we wonder, why is it I can't step out in faith? It's because we don't have any faith, because we've minimized God, because we've allowed our situation and our problem to get so big. But if you're honest with me today, we all have done that. Every one of us in this place have minimized God and made a problem bigger, haven't we? What is Elisha doing when the call of God hits his life? He is doing the ordinary, mundane, routine, daily job that was given to him to do. But this is what we've got to remember when we seek greater. God's got His eye on you. God's never taken His eye off of you. God knows exactly where you are and exactly what you're going through. This is not on the screen because I, I wanted to read it to you in the message today. But I want to take you to Ephesians 1, 3-6. And I think in Ephesians 1, 3-6, this explains a little bit of understanding that God's got His eye on every aspect of our life. It says this from the message, how blessed is God? How blessed is God? You think about the bigness and the greatness of God, God is blessed with everything. Why? Because He is everything. He's in everything, He is everything, and it is because of everything that we have is because of Him. How blessed is God? And what a blessing He is. All of those blessings He wants to pour out on His people. He's the Father of our Master, Jesus Christ, and takes us to high places of blessing in Him. Come on, I need a well, well. Somebody do the Chris Lopez for me today, okay? Can I stop for just a moment? Can I stop for just a moment? I'm excited about this message. No, 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 no. I am excited about this message. Life-changing, life-altering message. You know what I need? I need somebody to talk back to me today. Can you do that? Can you talk back? Can you help me out just a little bit? I'm, I'm, I'm excited about this message. So you just, you just yell back at me and you're not going to distract me, okay? He wants to take us to high places of blessing in Him. Okay, this is what I love. Are you ready for this? Long before He laid the foundation, laid down the foundation of the earth, He had us on His mind. Long before the foundations of the world was laid down, He knew exactly what Ronnie Woodward would go through he knew exactly what your last relationship would end with. He knew exactly that job that you thought went south. Maybe it didn't go south. Maybe it just had to change channels so God could promote you and take you into a new place of blessing in Him. New things of greater experience in Him. Long before the foundations of the earth, earth were, were formed, you were on God's mind. It's no, it's no mistake where God has placed you. It's not an accident what you went through. The enemy may come to steal, kill, and destroy. But God said, oh, but enemy, you ain't going to win because of what I did with Jesus Christ on the cross. We can conquer anything. Greater things are in store. Long before He laid the earth's foundations, He had us in mind. He settled on us and had settled on us as the focus of His love. Chris, He loves you, man! Don't you love that thought? For God so loved Chris. 
long before the foundations of the earth were formed. You were on His mind. And He said, I'm going to redeem you and I'm going to buy you back. It's His love. Long ago, He decided to adopt us into His family through Christ Jesus. And what pleasure He took in planning every bit of this. And He wants us to enter into the celebration of His lavish gift giving by the hand of His beloved Son. We're talking about greater. What are the greater things that God wants to do in our life? Anytime I think you talk about greater, there are a lot of people who immediately will disqualify themselves from what, they, from what I believe and what I believe the Word of God teaches about what God wants to do in your life. We disqualify ourselves at the opening sounding of the bell because we don't think we're worthy. We don't think we're smart enough. We don't think we're holy enough. We don't think we're godly enough. We don't think that we're in the right place yet. And we disqualify ourselves from anything greater that God wants to do. And I think it is very important that we understand what Elisha is doing when Elijah drops the mantle of the Holy Spirit of the guiding into his life. He is doing nothing special. He is going through the mundane routine of life when all of a sudden the Holy Spirit drops a greater responsibility on his life. So how do we describe this greater? It says in verse 19, So Elijah went up from there. Where did Elijah, Where is the from there that Elijah had to come from? It might help to know just a little bit of the backstory, but Elijah has just called down fire from heaven. An incredible miracle. We're not going to get into it right now. You can go and you can study it and read over it for yourself. But he has called down fire from heaven. He has done this incredible thing. There are all of these prophets, like 450 prophets of Baal that are against God. He thinks he is the only prophet now that is standing up for the things of God. He not only calls fire down and a miraculous miracle happens, he proves to the entire nation who God is. He then slaughters the 450 prophets of Baal. Don't you know by the time that takes place, this boy is wore out. He is tired. Have you ever found yourself in a ministry situation? Have you ever found yourself in a life situation? Have you ever found yourself in a place where you go, I think I am burned out? Anybody ever been there? This is where Elijah is. Elijah is burned out. He is done. He is, he is tired. He has fought for God. He has fought for God. He has fought for God. And now he's found himself at a place where he's worn out. And there is a queen by the name of Jezebel who has put a price on his head and she wants him dead. And in the middle of his tiredness, in the middle of his stress, in the middle of, of the greatest miracle and the greatest blessings of God, he gets more focused on his tired. He gets more focused on his stress. He gets more focused on his worn out ability. And he begins to complain to God even telling God, I wish I were dead. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how the enemy will attack after the greatest miracles? And if we're not careful, we will hand victory to an enemy that only comes to kill, steal, and destroy instead of trusting God for the miracle of being able to achieve something greater in our life. So here he is, and he's depressed. He's crying out to God. How many football fans do we have in the house? Has anybody ever seen a call that is questionable? And all of a sudden, you see the coach walk from the sideline and he pulls out a red challenge flag and he throws the challenge flag. What does that red challenge flag mean? I don't agree with your call and I want a redo. 
I want somebody else to look at this. Elijah is arguing with God. Elijah has pulled the red challenge flag out and he's thrown it in front of God's face and he's not exactly lacking where he's at. God, I'm the only prophet. God, I'm tired. God, why did you put all of this on me? God, why? I just wish I was dead. Sounds like a lot of us, doesn't it? Sounds like a lot of us in our complaining. But this is what is so interesting about the challenge flag that he throws in front of God. God brings a challenge to him. Let me fast forward. Elisha is plowing in a field. And he has no clue that before a greater calling has come upon his life, before he has any clue that God is about to change his life, before he has any clue that something else is about to happen, God is already working behind the scenes with a challenge to someone else and before Elisha even knows there's a greater call upon his life, God is speaking to Elijah, saying, Elijah, I want you to get up from here. I want you to get up from your funk. I want you to get up from this situation. And I want you to go because I am challenging you to do something greater in your life so you can pass the greatness on into somebody else's life. How many of us get stuck in the funk and the junk of life. And we miss the greater things of God because we can't move on. Elijah has no clue that God is already working in his life. Elisha has no clue that God is already speaking to Elijah. Elisha has no clue that God is about to promote him out of the mundane into the miraculous. He has no clue. All he is doing is he's going through the motions of life and just being consistent. He is just being consistent. He is just being consistent and faithful with what God has placed in His hands at the moment. And in His consistency, we don't see anything else of any greater Nothing of anything any greater is even mentioned in this story at this moment. All we know is God looks at a man and He says, You are consistent. You are consistent exactly where I've placed you. And in that consistency, I'm about to promote you to something greater. He's unaware that God is conspiring greater things for his life. He is unaware that God wants to bless him in a whole new way. He is unaware that his life is about to take a turn. It's about to turn the corner. And God is about to reveal himself and to show him something great. You see, this is what I know about consistency when we read this story. When you are plowing behind oxen, it's tedious work. When you are plowing behind oxen, for Elisha, it was the exact same sight every day that he got up and went to work. It was the same sight, it was the same sound, and it was the same smell. Can anybody say amen to that? Does that sound familiar to anybody? It was steady work. But you know, there's an old song that says, everybody's working for the weekend. Isn't that how we all feel? I'm stuck in a routine. I get up, I go through the motions, I do the exact same thing every day. And it seems like there's no change. There's no end to the monotony. It is just the same old, same old. Get up, go to work, do your thing, come home, feed the kids, feed the dog, feed the cat, feed the animals, go to bed only to wake up on Tuesday to repeat the same thing again. And I believe in the routine of the ordinary, God wants to show up and do the extraordinary. That's what I believe. Would there be anybody that say, I think I understand Elisha's life? Because every day, it was the same old, same old for him. 
There's a lot of scholars that believe that maybe he didn't just work for someone that owned these animals. There's a lot of scholars that believe that he owned the entire herd of oxen, if you call it a herd. He owned all of the oxen. That would be 24 oxen that he was in charge of, 24 teams of people that would work. And the Bible tells us that he was the 12th pair in a line of 11. And so he was a man that wasn't afraid to work. He was probably not rich, but well off. If anybody that can handle and own 24 oxen that you take out every day to work, he probably had a good job. He probably owned a good company. He probably had a good thing going for him. But how many of you know that for Elisha, every day that he stepped into the routine of life, that his view never changed? He was the last man on the totem pole. He was the caboose at the end of the train. And all he stared at all day long was oxen rears. The view never changed. The smell never changed. He looked at something that was basically the size of a trash truck and probably didn't smell much better either. And what we've got to understand is that nothing suggests at all that he was plowing because God had cursed him. He was just being consistent with what God had given him. And I believe God looked at the consistency of his life and said, I can use that for greater things. What are the greater things? Well, you got to understand, and I, I know that when you talk about greater things, there's a lot of people that don't get real excited about this. Because when we talk about greater, you're thinking better. And that's not what we're talking about. Some of you are going, maybe God wants me to have a better home or a better income, or a better influence, or maybe God wants things better in my life. And we look at it as a prosperity thing, almost like God is a one-armed bandit where we pick it, pull it down, and, and if it all comes up cherries, then I'm going to get a blessing that comes out of the box. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about not better, but we're talking about greater. How can you have a greater influence on somebody's life? How can you have a greater outcome? How can you have a greater walk with God and a greater relationship and a greater responsibility? Maybe God's not calling you to a, a better thing. Maybe God is asking you to be greater at the place that He has placed you. In a mundane, routine operation, maybe God is saying, I just need you to step up where you are and be the employee that the boss has hired you to be. I just need you in that classroom. I just need you in that doctor's office. I just need you in that restaurant. I just need you in that workplace. I just need you to be a greater influence to a people that's coming in because we live in a world of lost people that are literally going to hell that does not know who our Jesus is and maybe God is using you and has placed you to be a missionary in a place that some of us will never be able to go into. This morning I went to pick donuts up for everybody. And the line was wrapped all the way around the building. And I don't ever go into the donut stop. Not very often at all. But this morning I thought the line is too long. I don't have time to wait here. I've got turkey to go into the church. So I parked the car and I ran in and I went in. And guess what? They didn't even have my order ready. How dare them? So I had to wait. So I'm standing there waiting. And this gentleman walks in, an older gentleman. He walks up to me, stands beside me, and he goes, how are you doing? And I go, I'm doing great. It is a great day. And he goes, any day that you can get up and worship our Savior is a good day. And I went, okay, there might be a reason why the line was too long. There might be a reason why I got out and came in today. There may be a reason why I needed to talk to this man. And I said, man, that message right there will preach. And he said, could I give you a gift? And I said, yes, I would love for you to give me a gift. I'd like to give somebody. Can I give you a gift? I want to give you a gift that he gave me today. But he said, I want to give you a wooden nickel. And I said, I, said, I haven't seen a wooden nickel in forever. And he said, oh, but it goes so much further than just the wooden nickel. Because he said, without Christ... Life isn't worth a wooden nickel. And he said, I want you to know something. 
He had no clue who I am. He said, I want you to know something. He said, our Jesus died on a cross that we can have life. And he said, carry that wooden nickel in your pocket as a reminder that without Christ, it's not worth a wooden nickel. And I said, that's a good message. And he goes, ah, but he goes, I've got another one for you. So he pulls this other one out and he said, would you share this message with someone else and pass this along? And would you let them know that Jesus Christ is the reason for everything? And as I sat there talking to this guy today, I went, isn't that greater? Isn't that what greater is all about? That God just wants to show up in a greater way in our life, that we, he could, that we can be a greater testimony, that we can have a greater love, that we can have a greater experience, that there could be a greater moment and a greater understanding so that maybe God will promote me to something greater and maybe my understanding. And I sat there and I looked at that guy and I went, God, thank you that the line was too long. God, thank you that I had to get out and walk 23 steps into the building. God, thank you that my donuts were not ready because God, if you wouldn't have hesitated or had a, had a moment of a break, I would have never met him and heard about the love of God from somebody else that is just excited about Jesus. Greater things. Maybe God wants us to have a greater understanding. Maybe God wants us to have a greater responsibility. Maybe God wants us to have some greater results of his favor and his blessing, his mercy and his grace and his love. Maybe what God wants is maybe he wants us to step up exactly where we're at and become a, not better, but a greater mom or a greater dad with a greater responsibility. Maybe God wants us to step up as a husband or a wife and not be a better husband or a better wife, but be greater in the name of Jesus. That we demonstrate to each other a greater love because we understand the love of God. That we need to step up and have a greater calling of integrity. A greater calling of honor. What about a greater calling? of discipleship. But I think what's happened to so many people is for so many believers, we've slipped into survival, spiritual survival mode. And we found ourselves living in a place of comfortable complacency. How about miserable mediocrity? where we believe that we're no, nothing more than just living life behind a plow. We get caught in the routine of, I get up, I go to work, I come home, and I go to bed. I think there's a lot of people that God wants to speak to you through this series that He wants you to understand that when you understand the greatness of God and the greater things that He wants to do, it literally will change everything in your life. It will change everything in your life. Jesus said that anyone who has faith in Me will do greater things. Who's Jesus? He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the star breather because when He spoke, everything came into existence. Jesus, the one who has redeemed me, Jesus who is my Savior, Jesus who is the life changer, Jesus says anyone, that is all of us in this room, who has faith. What is faith? It is the substance of things hoped for. How many has got a hope? a desire, a want. It is of hope for the evidence of things not seen yet. He doesn't say any preacher who has faith. He doesn't say any priest or any millionaire. He doesn't say anybody that has just been so consistent in church their entire life. He doesn't say that. He says anybody, no matter what you're going through, no matter what plow you are behind, anybody can experience greater things and you will do greater things than what I ever did. Anybody. So what are the greater 
things that we're talking about. All Jesus needs at this moment from you, He needs faith and He needs this moment. That's it. He needs faith and He needs this moment. How many of you can say, well, I've got faith, but it's small. Well, the Bible says if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. And Jesus is saying, do you want to do greater things? Do you want to have a greater experience? Do you want to be greater in an influence? Do you want to have a greater outcome? All I need is I need faith, doesn't even say how big it has to be. He says, all I need is faith and just this moment. Right where you're sitting, the exact situation that you're in, what you are going through, all I need is this moment. And through faith in this moment, we can have greater things. The second thing is this. We see an invitation to a deeper surrender. It was an invitation to a deeper surrender. I believe... That in our day and time of our church and in our place and in our society and our town and in everything that you see that's going on, I believe God is calling the church to a greater surrender. I think it's time that we quit living below our ability. That we trust God to do something greater. The mantle flies over his shoulders and this is what it says in verse 20. Elisha then left his oxen and he ran after Elijah. And this is what he says, let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come to you. Elijah looks and he said, he replies, go back, what have I done to you? This is what I believe Elisha understood when the mantle fell upon his life. He understood that when the presence of God, when the Spirit of God, when the calling of God, when the anointing of God, when the mantle of the Holy Spirit lands upon your life, it is calling you to kiss some things goodbye. The calling of the Spirit of God is real. And sometimes we have to turn loose of things to grab a hold of the things of God. But instead, we want to hang on to the things of the world like this, hang on to the things like this, and we find ourselves in a constant tug of war in this life, and we wonder why in the world we can have no victory. We wonder why all we stare at is oxen rears all day long. We just we don't understand why in the world we cannot get promoted and we cannot move on. It's because we have not kissed the things of this world goodbye. And when Elisha said, let me go kiss the things of this world goodbye, Elijah looks at him with the reality of the call of God that is upon his life, and he says, what have I done? What he has done is he has now allowed God to move into his life to promote him from oxen rears to a greater experience. Do you know what the Word of God says about Elisha? The Word of God says, Elisha went on to do double the miracles that Elijah did. Why? Because when we open ourselves up, when we turn loose of the things of our past, God wants to do something absolutely incredible. But we've got to kiss the past goodbye. Verse 21 says, So Elisha left him and went back, and he took the yoke of oxen, and he slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment and he cooked to cook the meat and he gave it to all the people to eat and he set out to follow Elisha and to become his servant. Isn't that a little radical? I mean, do you think any of the neighbors called PETA on him when he started killing the cows? I mean, I look at it and I go, it's a little radical. It's a little insane. I don't know if I exactly understand why he did what he did, but I want you to think about his understanding of the call of God that was on his life. He took his livelihood, what brought in his bread and butter, what paid for his living, what, what, he, what his family lived off of. He took his livelihood and it says that he slaughtered 24 oxen. But he didn't just slaughter the oxen, which is, is a little odd to me. But then he took all of the plowing equipment and he built a fire with it, and he burned up every bit of the resources of his income 
because I believe he was telling his family. And if you want to look at this from a spiritual point of view, I believe he was telling the enemy. I believe he was telling himself and the prophet. In doing this, in kissing this goodbye, in killing the cow, and burning the plowing equipment, I have nothing to come back to. And I think that's what a lot of our problem is. Is as a dog returns to his vomit, we return to our sin over and over and over again. It don't taste good, but we return. The benefits don't get any better, but we return. We find ourselves in pain, agony, misery, not experiencing anything greater. Our conversation never changes. Our crude joke, jokes never go away. We still cuss like a sailor. We don't trust God for any difference in our life. We get stuck in the routine with the attitude just over and over and over again. I'm just an angry person, so I'm just going to be angry. Not going to turn loose of it, but I sure want what God wants. And we find ourselves in the tug of war of life. And God is saying, in the routine of what you're doing, and the faithfulness of what you're trying to do, don't get so caught up in the situation that you miss the greater things that I've got for you. He slaughters the oxen. He takes his plowing equipment and he cooks it. He burns it so he can cook the meat and he has nothing to return to and it is his sacrifice. It is his surrender to God. And the third thing that I want to close with is this. As we see it as an invitation to greater things. What is it that you want to trust God for? What is it that more than anything, and I want you to think for just a moment as I close, what is it more than anything that you'd love to see God do in your life? Would you love to see your marriage restored? Would you love to see the relationship with your kids be just a little bit stronger? Would you like to see your influence with people become a little bit more would you love to have a better understanding of who God is and a better understanding of what God is calling you to do? Because I think the majority of people that sit in our churches, if you ask them, what has God called you to do? Their first response will be, I don't have a clue. I don't, I don't know what my calling is. Could God be calling you to just be a greater influence where you're at? Be a greater mom. Be a greater dad. Be a greater kid. Amen. Be a greater employee. Be a greater church goer. Be a greater giver. Be a greater smiler. And a greater hugger. Maybe God just wants you to be a greater lover. You just show the love of God to people. Maybe God just wants you to hand some wooden nickels to somebody and just tell them about the greatness of God. It didn't take a whole lot of effort, but it meant everything in the world to me. What are the greater things that God is calling us to do? You know what I think it is? It may not be so much that we step out from behind the oxen rears right now but maybe what it might be is God is saying while you're doing the routine of life no matter what you're staring at no matter what you're going through no matter what it is where God has placed you even though you're stunk in the fug mire of life <laughs> don't get lost don't get lost there's things that we've got to turn loose of so we can grab a hold of some things of God and maybe God is calling us just to be greater where we're at. So this series is all about learning how to dream bigger. How many can, can dream big? Huh? How many can dream big? But what God is showing us, let's start smaller. Let's start smaller. Let's actually be able to reach out and grab a hold of the little things that are tangible. Because I think too often we, we try to go too big for God and then we get lost in the process. So, you got a homework assignment for the next week. 
Are you ready for your homework assignment for the next week? How many will actually do your homework assignment for the next week? All three of you. Five. Okay. We just went. Come on, help me out here. Help me out here. Okay, there we go. How many will help me out with this? We're going to dream big and we're going to start small and we're going to see if we can ignite a new passion of God in our life. And this is what I want you to do, okay? Every opportunity and every chance that you get, I want you to start small and smile at somebody. <laughs> there we go. Come on, everybody practice. Come on now, everybody practice. Can we do that? We're going to learn how to smile. We're going to start small. And let me tell you something. That genuine smile coupled with the love of God may open more doors in your life than anything. We're going to start small and we're going to trust big. We're going to dream big. But I'm going to pray that as we just step out and begin to do something different, that's what this whole series is about, is doing something different. That as we begin to do something different, that God is going to do something incredible in our lives. Right where you're sitting, every head bowed, nobody looking around. This altar call has nothing to do with standing. This altar call has nothing to do with stepping out. This just has to do with the reality of life. And this is, this is the altar call today. How many of us in this place would just say, I truly am hungry for something different from God? That's it. I'm, I'm hungry for something different. If that's you, I'm going to pray for you today. I'm not asking for you to raise your hand. I'm not asking to, for, for you to look up and acknowledge. This is between you and God and nobody else. I'm just hungry for something different from God. If that's you, I'm going to pray for you. God, here I am, and I'm not perfect. God, here I am, and even though sometimes I feel like I'm just stuck in the routine of life, through this sermon today, I realize that you still have your eye on me. You still know where I'm at, and you still know exactly what I'm going through. So today, God, here I am. I am going to kiss the past goodbye. And once and for all, I'm really going to let go of it. I'm going to let go of unforgiveness. I'm going to let go of some hurt. I'm going to let go of some pain. I'm going to let go of some things that have helped me back from what you want to do in my life. So today, I lay it at the foot of the cross. Today, I give it to you. Today, as I lay it down, God, I pick up the mantle of the Holy Spirit upon my life. And today, I make a decision to walk forward in the greater things of God. God, I pray that today, that as people give this to you, that you will bless them, that you will be with them, that you will encourage them. And this is what I pray, in the simpleness of life, that as we do the little things in life, I'm going to pray that you will begin to bless every step that we take. As we smile, let the love of God come through our smile. Let people see the love of God in our smile. Let that smile be an encouragement that opens a door of a reality that God truly wants to do something greater in our life. And if you receive that, say amen. 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 God's good, isn't He?